We'll turn to Titus 3. I want to briefly review that, and then we're going to go to Titus 2, and what we're going to talk today about is self-control. That's basically what I'm going to do, a topical study on self-control. But for the sake of us really getting down even what we studied last week, I want to go back to Titus 3 really quick. So in Titus 3, we looked at last week, if you're looking at verses 1, we see Paul telling Titus to remind them, and he gives some specifics. Be submissive to rulers and authorities, obedient. He ends by saying, show perfect courtesy toward all people. And last week we looked at what did Paul point Titus to appeal to in order to get these people to obey? What was the first thing? that He directed them to look at. Yeah, what did you used to be? And so in verse 3, He's he's saying, well, brothers, you yourselves used to be just like these people you don't want to submit to in the government. Maybe it was one of the thoughts He was thinking there. And then in verse 4, Paul goes in to remind Titus what changed from verse 3. He reminds them of sound doctrine in the Gospel. In verse 4, He says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we saw in verses 4 through 7 that He gave sound doctrine in the Gospel. And then we looked at verse 8. The saying is trustworthy. The sound doctrine we just talked about is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on the Gospel, on sound doctrine. And if you do this, why do it, Paul? So that those who have believed in God, the true Christian, they will be careful to devote themselves to the good works in verses 1 and 2. They will be careful to submit themselves to rulers and authorities because they remember where did I come from And then they remember the great salvation and sound doctrine. So, I want to mention that again tonight because as we talk about self-control, it's no different. Me reminding you guys and all of you to be self-controlled in different areas of your life, the only way you'll be self-controlled in those areas is one, remember where you came from. Remember the wickedness. Remember when you're lost how unself-controlled you were in every area of your life. And then two, remember the Gospel. Remember the goodness of God that appeared to you and He raised you from the dead without you taking initiative and He saved you according to His mercy. And that's got to be the motive for why I'm going to exercise self-control. It's got to be because of Christ. It's got to be because of the Gospel. It's got to be my motive. So let's look at Titus chapter 2. In Titus 2, we find out this issue of self-control is for all of us. Look at verse 2. Older men are to be, and he has in there, self-control. Look at verse 3. Older women, so if you're an older woman, it says they are to teach what is good and train the younger women to love their husbands and children and be self-controlled. Now, it doesn't directly tell the older women to be self-controlled, but if you're telling the older woman to teach a younger woman to be self-controlled, the implication is that older woman knows what self-control is. That's the only way she's going to teach the younger woman to be self-controlled. Look at verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men, and that's a lot of what we have here tonight, to be self-controlled. So, older women, older men be self-controlled. Older women who already know self-control, be that and teach the younger women to be self-controlled. And then he urges the younger men to be self-controlled. And then in verse 9, he talks about bond servants. But any bond servant is a man, woman, old, or young. So it includes, includes everyone. So everyone's being told to be self-controlled. Now, why teach on self-control? Why teach on self-control? Yeah he's, remind, yeah, he's reminding them to do something that they're maybe not doing as well. And main answer is verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. What does it mean to be in accordance with sound doctrine? 
It means it's fitting. It means it resembles sound doctrine. Self-control in your life is fitting to sound doctrine. Meaning it's one of the evidences you even have sound doctrine. It's fitting. It resembles sound doctrine. Think about uh, a car. What, what's something that resembles cars? They all have what? Wheels. Right? Wheels are fitting, resemble a car. Self-control resembles sound doctrine. It resembles a Christian. It's something every true Christian is going to have self-control in their life. They're going to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If I, if, I mean, example, if I'm teaching you guys tonight on self-control, which I am, and you guys look at my life and know I'm not self-controlled, I have no authority. Because I'm a hypocrite. Be self-controlled. Well, that James guy is the guy who I've seen him not turn his head at something inappropriate instantly. Or that James guy is the guy who he can't stop talking. He can't control his mouth. Or as my wife reproved me on recently, We had guests over at our house and I was sitting over there biting on my fingernails. I didn't have self-control. And my wife, James, what's going on? That was hypocritical of me. I'm supposed to be a man. Men aren't going around biting their nails. We're getting rid of little habits like that. In the smallest of ways, I'm wanting to exercise self-control. And that looked bad for the people who were over to see me, an elder in the church, biting on my fingernails. That's That's not good. So, yeah, you could be a hypocrite. Now, why, why is self-control in accordance with sound doctrine? Why is it in accordance? And our brother already pointed out, it's verse 11. Look at verse 11. And, and so on. Let's read this right here. For the grace of God has appeared. Well, that's good news. Grace from God has appeared. What has it done? Bringing salvation for all people. Verse 12 training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Okay, so this grace is training us. And what else is it training us to do? And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You notice that? So sound doctrine, the grace of God, it's supernaturally working in every one of us to live a self-controlled life. If you're a Christian, you can't help but be self-controlled. When you're not, the Spirit's convicting you. When you're not, there's just something unsettling. You, you don't have peace. Not having control of your members. Not having control of your mind. Not having control of your tongue. Not having control of uh, anything. And the very grace of God guarantees every true Christian is going to live a self-controlled life. And you know, I love the first word in verse 12. It's training us. You know, If you, if you think about it, Think when the Lord saved you and think about where you're at now. Think of the progress that God's already done in your life to make you more self-controlled. Has anyone seen that? What about you, Kevin? Are you... Yeah. What's the practical example you feel comfortable giving? Eating. And isn't it... Don't you feel it? It's like this grace is training you. It's like you can't even fully explain it, but God's doing it supernaturally. When you think about grace, remember grace, the common term used is unmerited favor. And that deals with justification. But grace is not just unmerited favor where you're forgiven and you don't deserve it, but it's unmerited power. It's undeserved power in regeneration. And when God saves a man, He's not just forgiving him, but He's changing him on the inside, giving him a new heart. And so grace is so much more than just forgiveness. It's power from God that He pours on us. So let's think about what is self-control. If I'm going to tell you like Paul tells the older women, the older men, the younger men, and the younger women to be self-controlled, what is it? What is self-control? Let's think about the the two uh, words in the word. Self-control. The first word is what? Self. What does self deal with? Did you say? Yeah, self deals with me. Yeah, personal. So this is something that I've got to do. Mario can't exercise self-control for me. I've got to exercise my own self-control. And the word self, you could think about selfishness. When you're not exercising self-control, you're being selfish. You're doing something sinful. It's a desire of self. But self-control 
means I have what under control? My desires. Self-control, the word control is to manage and steer these desires. It's to control one's desires and impulses. Just like we control a car. You determine how many miles you're driving an hour. You determine when you hit on the brake. You're in control. And self-control means I have control over this body. I've got control over my thoughts. These things, I have control over them. <clears throat> the word in verses um, self-control, say the word in verses 12, is also rendered as sober-minded. Sober-minded. Now it also says sober-minded uh, in the beginning. It says older men are be sober-minded. Why, why would the word self-control be rendered sober-minded multiple times in the Scriptures? How is it the same thing? You know, what is even the difference? What were you saying? Well, more, more importantly, think about, think about, say, my action uh, to turn my head and look at something. Do I have self-control to not lust? Well, that deals with what's going on in my mind. It deals, is my mind sober? Is it sensible? Am I thinking about eternal things? Am I setting my mind on things above where Christ is seated? What's going on in my thought life? Depending on what's going on in your thought life is going to depend what you're going to do with your members. What you're going to do with your body. If you're going to exercise self-control or not. Matthew 12 says, Out of the abundance of my heart, what happens? My mouth speaks. I'll tell you, catch people. When they, when they say something to you and then they say, well, I didn't mean that, catch them with that verse. No, you did mean that. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth spoke. You didn't accidentally just say what you just said. It was coming from inside. I mean, I've talked to people in evangelism and they'll say something and say, I didn't really mean that. It wasn't an accident it came out. It was what was in their heart. So Matthew... 12, 34 is a good verse there. But the point of me reading that verse is it shows what's in your heart, what's in your mind. That's why you say what you say. So when we talk about self-control of my tongue, if I don't have my heart under control, if my mind isn't under control, this tongue is just going to be running wild saying all sorts of things. Someone said, self-control... This is from Precept Austin, that website. It's very helpful. It means acting like one with a saved mind. Curbing one's desires and impulses and so describes the man who is self-controlled, self-restrained, and careful. This man's mind has everything under control of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word conveys the idea that this man knows how to stop, when to quit, when to say no whether in thought life or in physical action. So ask yourself, are you self-controlled? <clears throat> we have desires daily that need to be controlled. I mean, how many of us have exercised self-control today? That should be everyone. And if you haven't exercised self-control, there's a problem. Jesus said, if you're going to come after Me, what are you going to do? Die to yourself daily and pick up your cross and follow Me. So self-control is something we do all the time, whether it's with food, whether it's with our minds. I mean, every one of us has got to seek to keep our mind sober throughout the day. To not let our mind be drunk and intoxicated with all manner of things of the world. So, question again, why can someone exercise self-control? Because you're born again and a Christian. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't have the fruits of the Spirit in a true, genuine way. And what's one of the fruits of the Spirit? Self-control. So the only way we'll have self-control is if we're saved and have the Holy Spirit if we've turned and put our trust in Christ. Okay, before we get into some practicals, the last thing which our brother already brought out is verse 15. Verse 15 says, Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. One thing we don't want to do is disregard self-control. We don't want to despise self-control. What's one reason why not to despise self-control? Paul gives a reason in 1 Corinthians 9. What's a reason not to despise it? Yeah, you'll be cast away. 
1 Corinthians 9, 25, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. That's what the athlete does. Paul says if they do that, how much more we who are going for this eternal crown. He says, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be cast away or disqualified. So when you think about self-control, this is not something to disregard and say, man, this just doesn't matter that much. This is the difference between heaven and hell. Doesn't mean I'm saved because I exercise self-control. Doesn't mean I save myself, but that's a fruit that someone's a Christian. It's a fruit of the Spirit, as Galatians 5 says. Proverbs 25.28 says this, A man without self-control is like a city broken into left without walls. You hear that? A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. What did walls do on cities back in the old day? What was so important? Protected them. If you have no wall, you have no protection. So what he's saying is if you have no self-control, you've got no protection. A man without self-control is just a vulnerable city. Anything that comes his way, he has no ability to say no to it. And that's how we were when we were lost, right? I had no wall. I would, every sin that came towards me, I would say yes to it. Or the ones I denied, I would deny them because of the sin of pride. Well, I don't want to be wicked like those outward sinners. So I was just sinning by being self-righteous. So when we talk about self-control, we're not talking about let go and let God. Remember Mac Tomlinson mentioned that a couple years ago at the fellowship conference? A lot of Christians want to say, I just need to let go and let God. God's, God's going to get everything in order. Paul here, when he urges younger men to exercise self-control, he's not urging them because God's just going to do it magically. You and I all have responsibility to exercise self-control. So, here's something to remember. We're going to look at some practical things, and I want you guys to be thinking of examples too, like our brother Kevin gave us one. Because I want us to stir each other up to exercise more self-control. Not in the obvious things. None of us here need to get told to exercise self-control in the area of sexual lust. We all know that. That's obvious, right? Food, that's not as obvious. Things like that aren't as obvious. Gossip, not as obvious. But here's something to remember is. Remember, to exercise self-control is about not being selfish and earthly-minded, but setting your mind on the Lord and living your life for Him. Self-control is to let the love of Christ control you and live for Christ. So, when I exercise self-control, it's not just I'm not doing something, it's because I'm too busy being controlled by the love of Jesus Christ. I've got to be doing that in my life. Second Timothy says this, for people will be lovers of self. And he gives a characteristic of a lover of themselves without self-control. Not loving good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All of us have two options. Be a lover of yourself or a lover of God. That's it. It's, it's one or the other. Today, as I live my day, I've had those options. Am I going to love God? Or am I going to love the momentary pleasure of the world? Every turning point in this day today, I've been faced with those types of decisions. And I've had to exercise self-control. Am I going to love God? Am I going to love the pleasure of this world? So it says, lovers of self, they're not lovers of God. What's one thing that will help us be completely convinced to exercise self-control in certain situations? It's realizing how sinful and disgusting sin is. One brother mentioned this. You know how in Peter it talks about a dog returning to his vomit? Someone going back to sin? Think about self-control like that. When you don't exercise self-control, you're basically going to your vomit like a dog and you're eating it. That's what you're doing. And so we need to think about that. When I'm called to exercise self-control and out throughout my life, I need to remember how sinful sin is. I need to not make excuses for it. 
I need to not minimize it, but I need to identify it. You know, Kevin, have you ever made excuses when it comes to gluttony and food? Yeah. So you, yeah, you won't be eating later, so that'll work out. Did you, did you eat later? Yeah. See, that's an excuse. What's, what's an example of minimizing self-control? Minimizing it. I mean, it, the example I already gave. Biting, biting my nails. Not having the ability to just stop biting my nails. Someone may say, wow, James, you're being too tough on yourself. But no, I don't want to minimize that. This body, I should be able to get it to stop from going, I don't have to, I don't have to do that. Is that really small? It is. But guess what? I want to have control of these members. I don't picture Jesus Christ walking around this world unable to control His hands. He had ability to control His members. So yeah, don't make excuses. Don't minimize. Identify. Identify. You know, what doctor takes a patient and doesn't first identify what's going on? What's wrong? Okay. So, let's think on some practical things. He, he addressed here older men, older women, young women, younger men. And so at first I thought to go through all four of those categories and try to think of some practical things. Um, but let's, let's just start out with some practical things for both groups. And the first one I had listed is what our brother already mentioned, that's food. Food. Exercising self-control when it comes to food. Why? One, one reason this is very important, what does Philippians 3 say about some? Their God is their, their belly. Isn't that amazing? Their God is their belly. There are people who their God is their belly. Meaning, their belly is literally their control center. The belly says, give me food. Yes, Master, I will get you food. What do you want? A buffet? I will get you that. I mean, it's literally their God. They're going after it. Some of y'all know when I was lost, at around 3 a.m. at night, I'd be playing video games all night, I idolized bacon. And I would wake up in the middle of the night, cook a pound of bacon, eight eggs, two green peppers, and an onion in one pan, and eat it all. And it made me feel disgusting. But I was a glutton when I was not a Christian. But it's been interesting now that I'm converted how I still have same temptations. Not to get up at three and make a pound of bacon. But food. Food. Their God is their belly. I thought about Proverbs 30 where Agar prayed. In verse 8 he said, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is needful for me. Needful for me. Proverbs 30. Does anyone remember why Agur prayed, give me food that's needful for me? Just give me the right amount? What was he afraid that would happen? Lest I be full and deny the Lord and say, who is the Lord? Isn't that amazing? This guy prayed for moderation in money and food because he had a fear if he became too full, even of food, it could lead him to deny the Lord. That fits right with 1 Corinthians 6 9. One of the people who won't inherit the kingdom of God is who? The glutton. The glutton. So, food, when we think about self control, you know, with food, it really comes down to, it, it kind of comes down to this instantaneous where you've got to make the right choice. Because think about, think about, you know, I'm at home at times and I've got a desire for food and I instantly have to determine, is this right, is this not? Is this me lusting after the food? Is it me going to the food for comfort? You know, the world jokes about women and chocolate, going to chocolate for comfort or whatever. The sad thing is that's reality. Some people, that's, that's their thing. I'm depressed right now. Let me go get some chocolate and it'll make me feel better. I mean, has anyone done that? But see, don't say all the time. You just minimized it. Say again. Right. So 
So did you buy it? No, not today. See, what'd you exercise? Well, self-control, but yeah, self-control. And that's, see, and you did the math. You realized uh, there's a temptation here to get those doves, which they tempt you with right at the checkout. Really cheap prices. And then you're waiting there, and then you have a long time to think about it, and you pick it up, put it, in, ah, put it back, ah, pick. But you, you thought right. This will not solve the root problem. This food won't satisfy the deep longings of my soul. Only Jesus Christ can. And that's the key to all self-control. If we're not t- exercising self-control from, say, worship of food for comfort, and we're going to get in comfort in Christ, you're, it's not going to do any good. You can't turn away from gluttony and just turn to a blank wall. As Tim said, you've got to turn to Christ and be satisfied in Him. But, you know, food, food is interesting. None of us can fast the rest of our lives. All of us will need food till we die. That means every one of us, till the day we die, has opportunities to exercise self-control in regards to food. Fifty years from now, if I'm still living... I'm going to have to exercise self-control in regards to food. It's an ongoing war till the day we die. It's not some once and for all victory. Yeah. And it's so easily accessible. I don't have to go shoot a deer, cook it, you know, and, <laughs> and eat. I mean, you can, you can add a moment. Look, brethren, be sensitive and don't defile your conscience. Don't do it. You're better off. I mean, there are times I'm in a war of is it right or not. You know what the safest thing for me to do is? Is to just deny myself and not eat that food right there. If I don't really have it figured out, and I'm thinking, is this the devil condemning me? But then I just keep thinking about it. The safest way is rather than giving in to that indulgence is to just exercise self-control. At the same time, what did Timothy say? Paul said to Timothy, these things are created to be received with thanksgiving. And so we should be thankful for Dove chocolates when we're going to it and we are doing it with the right heart. And that's really what uh, self-control in regards to food deals with is where is my heart at? Am I going there to find comfort? Can I say no? That's a good question. When you're thinking about buying something, can you say no and not do it? If you can't say no, then right there you've got your problem. If you find it's impossible to say no, that's a problem. You're not exercising self-control. Here here an illustration or example. The Lord tested me. When I lived at the Grace House years ago, I went to the HEB and I bought uh, my favorite meals. Mashed potato, corn, and a pound of hamburger meat. And I just, I had worked hard that day. I was hungry. I just, I couldn't wait to cook it. It tasted so good. Well, I go... So the H-E-B, I get it, I get home, and I start cooking it. And you know what started to happen next? A bunch of vultures started flying into the kitchen. Some came from upstairs. They were human beings. They were men who lived in the grace house. And I'm sitting there cooking, and I knew it. I thought, no, Lord, don't, don't have them ask for food. I don't want to share my food with any of them. Lord, I work so hard for this food. I deserve it. I mean, I literally was just... I was idolizing my food. I was being selfish. And I, I, mean, I knew I had to exercise self-control. This selfish desire, I had to keep it under control. So, in the end, the Lord did help me. And I offered it to a couple of them. And one only ate a little bit and gave me some, so I got some anyways. But that, that was an example where I got tested. I did not expect when I got home that I'd be tested on the spot with self-control. And how often is that how it is? You have no time to prepare, and bam, you're in a test. Self-control or not. In the mind, wherever. So that's food. Does anyone have any more thoughts on food? Self-control in regards to food. Okay. So money. Let's think about exercising self-control in regards to money. I mean, the, the biggest question... I mean, even, even our sister's example there with food, it also dealt with money, too. She had a decision in a moment, I could use some money and impulse buy Dove chocolates for a buck, 20, or whatever it is. Now, like Mario mentioned, we're in such abundance, little decisions like that so often, we don't, 
We don't think about it that much. But it's something. Bethany and I went to Missouri and we drove back and you look at the credit card bill. It's amazing what all the little snacks along the way add up to. It's amazing what all the eating out up on the way adds up to. So when we think about self-control with money, again, the big question is, can I control the impulse to buy something? You know, how many people have purchased something without sleeping on it and praying on it and regretted it? I mean, I know people in the church, they, they went and bought a car, they didn't even sleep on it, pray on it, and then weeks later they realized, you know, I got a lemon of a car, a car's going to break down, or I got ripped off. Here that same car is for $2,000 less. All that had to take place is self-control. Restraining. Being able to wait. Being able to not have to say yes instantly. You, know, you think about money, credit cards. You know, credit cards, I mean, I've even found this with myself at times where, and I, I don't have any debt, praise God, but it's interesting, you can feel more comfortable to make purchases because of a credit card. And it makes it easier to not have to exercise self-control. makes it easier to not have to really think about, do I really need to buy this or do I not? I mean, think about how many things you've bought that are now sitting around and never really got used. Has anyone done that? What's an example? Does anyone have an example? Something you bought compulsively and now it just sits around and it never really gets used. I mean, books. Say again. A what? Oh, a juicer. See, $100. Ken? <laughs> Didn't I tell you to wait? No. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You know, think about a church where we're all sensitive and exercising self-control. Not perfectly, but we're striving for it. Think of how much money we would save that we could give to things like the Iraq trip. That we could give to missions. And it really all does add up. Um, clothing is a big thing. You know, you go to a clothing store, and you got a credit card with only 50 bucks in your bank account, but hey, credit. I mean, you could buy. I mean, it just depends on personality. Some of us don't even care at all about clothing. Some people, mainly, mainly the women, they do care. And it's easy to not exercise self control, to think I've got to have this shirt. You know, I, I, I know my wife at times has said, well, James, do you want me to keep wearing the same shirts every other week? <laughs> well, honey, I mean. I want to be sensitive to you, but... And then you know what happens? Someone comes along and gives her some shirts. And we didn't have to spend a dollar. So money. I don't know. Someone else have a thought. Self-control in money. You know, a big thing too is contentment. Am I content where I realize if this is not a necessity, I don't have to purchase this thing right now. I can say no. Am I content with what I have? And you know, and, and, and the thing is, it's, we've got to walk with the Lord ourselves. For one of you, you may be able to buy the full $4 shampoo and it's totally fine. But we each have to determine these things ourselves. You know when you go astray. Because God and you and Christ have a personal relationship if you're a Christian. And He, he will deal with us in different ways. Some of us can't go to the buffets. Some of us can. $4 shampoo, buck fifty. Some of you know, it depends. So you see what I'm saying? I just want to say that to make, we don't want to bind each other's conscience. It's not that you're doing that in any way, but just to give clarity. But anyone else have something with money? Self-control in regards to money. Yeah, some people have to exercise self-control to not give hypocritically. When you know something's not right in your heart, you have to be able to say, I'm not, I'm not going to give for that false motive. I'm not going to whatever, self-control. I mean, I've had to exercise self-control in prayer meetings before and not pray because I felt something wasn't pure entirely in my heart. I could have not exercised self-control and prayed hypocritically and maybe no one would have known it. I would have. But self-control. So yeah, sometimes self-control to, to give and sometimes not to give if we know something's not right in our heart. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Well, the next thing common is speech. Exercising self-control in my speech, in my words, in what I say. I mean, if we added up all the words that all of us spoke today, it would be in the thousands. Just thousands. All of us have said so many things today. How many where I didn't exercise self-control? It says in Proverbs 29.20, Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? No self-control? There is more hope for a fool than for him. There's more hope for a fool who's just too dumb to say anything than someone who has something to say and they're just hasty and they say it too quick. You know, God, at least in my life, has had a way of humbling me that when I've been hasty to speak sometimes, it ends up making me look like a fool. And He does it to humiliate me. To show me, look, you spoke too quick. You know, I was first a Christian before people were even done talking. I'd kind of cut them off because I think, oh, I knew what they're saying. And I'd just kind of cut them off mid-sentence. And then they'd finish their thought and I realized my counsel to them didn't, wasn't helpful at all. I didn't have the love to wait and listen to what they were going to say. James 1.19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So are you slow to speak and good at exercising self-control with this ton of yours? You know, think about it. You have a thought to say something. Are you able to say, no, I won't say that? Even take it, yeah, to the internet. I mean, there's been times I've been typing some emails out, statuses out, on I'll be on his Facebook, Whatever and something hasn't seemed right, and part of me wants to hit enter on that email. But it's like the Lord is saying, no, don't. Exercise self-control in your words. Exercise self-control in that email you're about to send. You know, have you ever been in a conversation where say you're talking to someone, and a thought comes in your mind, and you think that'd be good to say, but then you realize I shouldn't say it, but then you say it anyways? Does it ever happen? Sometimes it's, it's saying something hurtful. Now I've had this happen where I'm in the conversation and a thought comes and it'd be a good thought for my argument and my side. But then I realize it'd be hurtful. It could maybe manipulate my wife or the person I'm talking to. And on the spot there, I've got to be restrained by the Holy Spirit to be able to exercise self-control and not say what I was about to say. Not that it was wrong, it was truth, but it was not the right setting. And self-control says, I want all my words to be like apples on a golden plate at the right setting, at the right time. You know, the psalmist said, keep a door, keep a guard over the door of my lips. That's what self-control is about. Keep a guard over the door of my text messages. Keep a guard over the door of my Facebook, my email, my words. And if, and if you're not keeping a guard over your thoughts, you're toast when it comes to your emails. If your mind isn't already right and walking with God, all, all, everything else is going to fall miserably. Yeah. Yeah, gossip is huge. Juicy morsels, the Proverbs talks about. How many, to- how many, think, how many have had a juicy morsel and you just felt like you had to go tell someone else and you ended up saying it, and then later you just regretted it. You hurt a friendship. You hurt... Uh, it just does damage. Gossip. Slander. It's horrible. We have to be able to restrain our lips to not say certain things. So, am I a man who's hasty in my words? Or am I a man who can exercise self-control? Anyone have any more thoughts on self-control with your tongue, with your speech? Dexter. But if you're thinking Titus 3, boy, for we ourselves used to be disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions. I, I was no different than them if it wasn't for the goodness and great goodness of God that appeared. And that's why, we, again, the only way you'll exercise self-control is if you're living a life focused on the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or else you'll have no hope. 
of making the right decisions at the right time. Because again, self-control, it just comes upon you. Even tonight in the Bible study, some of you are exercising self-control. Tonight, in your mind, in different areas. Nicholas, did you have something? Yeah. Well, my, this happened to me once. I went on a walk with someone, and they started to slander a pastor in another church. Or, you know, they didn't start to do that instantly. Let me. We're walking, and it was interesting. They started to tempt me with curiosity. I mean, I really got tempted. They had some information, and I felt like, what? who's he referring to? Because he didn't mention names in the beginning. And you know what? I had a curiosity, who's he referring to? And yeah, I should have exercised self-control there and cut it off. No, I don't, I don't need to hear any of that. But I gave in and heard, and he started to talk filth, and then I finally cut it off. I realized this is wrong. I don't need to hear this. This, guy's, this is slander. This is gossip. And so, in a situation like that, you, the person's got to determine to, ex, to be bold and not want to hear the juicy morsel. You know, it, it, I mean, it, perfect example. You go on Google news feed and you see a title that's really curious. But you're about to go and hear a sermon. Do you exercise self-control and do what you intended to do when you got on the internet? Or do you click on the really interesting news feed? You know, here we have all this stuff going on in the Middle East. I'll tell you that, some of that's been very tempting to me. To be very, to, to fall into distraction on different news updates. And it, it's something to exercise self-control. Your mouse, and you're about to click on it, or here you have your smartphone, and you're about to hit on it, and you think, wait a minute, my whole mission of taking my phone out of my pocket was to respond to an important email. And now I'm going to a news feed that wasn't my goal, I'm wasting my time, I'm going to exercise self-control and not do it. Can anyone relate to that? I mean, that, that is an area we can easily minimize. Well, I only lost 10 minutes of my time. If you lose 10 minutes, of your, if you lose 10 minutes a day for the rest of your life, you're going to lose so much time you could have used for God's glory, for His purposes. And you're just going to burn it up. Yeah, I mean, if... What Eric's saying, you know, if, if I can't exercise, say with money, for example, isn't it interesting, the, the Christians who God allows to have a lot of money, they're very self-controlled people. God's giving them a lot of money because He knows they can handle it. They're able to make right decisions with it. Same thing with, you know, any, anything, a ministry opportunities. God will not give you a bigger ministry opportunity if you don't have self-control and can't handle the situations. So yeah, if we're faithful and little, the Lord may give us more in different areas. What time do we have? 8.55. Well, you know, I mentioned self-control and lust. I don't think any of us need to hear that. But I'll I'll tell you, brethren, exercise self-control in lust. Don't give in. Remember the proverb? What does it say? The man doesn't know that the adulteress's woman's door, where does it lead? To hell. Lust is a biggie. Now, it's not just lust for female or male body parts. It's not just that. Lust for possessions. Lust for, hear this one, noise. Lust for noise. We live in a generation where people are constantly needing noise. Look, if you're here and you're not able to be alone with God for a while and you have to keep having noise and things running through your mind, you're not exercising self-control. Does that make sense? Or might you have a blank look? Yeah. Noise. You know, here an example is of myself. I've been in a very deep conversation before, and my phone vibrates, and I know I have a text message. Do I have the ability to exercise self-control and wait until later, once this important conversation is done, to check who sent me a text message? 
Do I have the ability to say no? Do I have the ability to snuff out the curiosity in my mind who just texted me? Can I say no? Practically speaking, it's just how God's dealt with me. I remember when I was first saved, I would wake up, and so many times before I would seek God, I would end up looking at my emails. And those days never ended good. They never began good. They began distracted. I couldn't now go read God's Word because I knew all these emails I had to respond to. So one thing I've practically done the last four plus years of my life, I will never look at my emails. I will never look at missed calls or texts or things like that when I wake up. I, I take the phone, I put it in my pocket, and I go and I read the Word. And at breakfast with my wife is when I'll finally check to see what's going on. Because I, I've, I've found if I don't exercise self-control, I'm, I'm, my mind becomes distracted. So can you be still? That's, that's part of the whole thing with self-control with me beating my nails even. Can I just be still? I mean, do I have the ability to just determine, Lord, help me to be still? To just sit? Hmm. Submit to governing authority. I mean, I remember some Christian guy who <laughs> speeded and got a ticket or whatever, and next thing you know, his mug shot's on the internet. I mean, that's bad. But the first thing he was mentioning, look, this is, is very practical. Say, say I'm talking to Mario. I'm talking to Mario right now. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm talking. Notice if I look over his shoulder, it, take, it takes self-control to not do that. Here I'm talking to him, and I'm not getting distracted with everything else. You know, if I've got a daughter, yeah, I'm going to look for my daughter or something. That's one thing that I learned from my father-in-law, Bob Jennings. I kid you not, it's like if a storm was going on behind me, he would just stare me at the eyes and give me his full attention. And I remember talking to a younger Christian, and they said he did the same thing for them. And it just shocked them. They felt like Bob Jennings was giving them his full attention. And when I heard that, I realized I need to do that. And I remember after Bob's funeral at the graveside, I'm talking to a lady, and I'm talking to her about this very thing, how Bob, the Lord really used Bob to teach me that. And I was looking over her shoulder the next moment and distracted and not giving her full attention. And then I apologized to her. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I was just telling you about that. And here I'm all distracted by all these people. And again, there's a, there's a place to look over the shoulder. But it's a general rule. Think, do you have self-control to be so focused in giving yourself to this person? I mean, how many of us have been on the other end of a conversation where the person's looking over our shoulder? It's kind of like, all right, well, how do we end this conversation then? They really don't want to be talking to me. Or they may really want to, but it may appear like you don't. You see? So it's very practical. I, I've been trying to do that more just to really give people my undivided attention in conversations. Here, this is a quote. I know we're about to finish up because I know the time. But going with what Eric was saying, someone said, if you're unwilling to just stop and submit to someone else by listening to them, rather than you want to be in control, rather than you want to be in control and be feeding your mind with what you want at that time. Meaning, it's an issue of submission. Can I, I'm called to submit to one another out of reverence of Christ, Ephesians says. Can I submit to Mario and let him talk to me on whatever he wants and not have to go and feed the lust of checking my cell phone, feed the lust of I want to get to another conversation? Can I submit to my brother and give him my undivided attention? If I can't do that, the issue is submission, which is just a lack of love. I don't love him enough to believe that what he's about to tell me is important to him and that's why he's conversing with me about this very thing. Yeah, and self, the root of self-control con self is not being selfish. It's having your selfish desires under control because your desire is Jesus Christ. Well, let me close with Spurgeon. Young men, exhort them to have that which is thought to be a virtue of age, namely self-control. Let them be old when they are young that they may be young when they are old. You hear that? Let them be old when they are young, 
that they may be young when they are old. And when, when you think about mature Christians, their life is going to be full of self-control. They're not impulsive. Uh, they're not, they just have control. They're not easily distracted by the smallest of things. Self is under control. Why? Because they're walking so near to Jesus Christ who was perfectly self-controlled His entire life and He never failed, period, in being self-controlled. So, I know it's getting late. I had... Yeah, my mother-in-law had mentioned... Self-control is very important. If a friend comes to us for counsel and shares intimate details of a problem, we for sure want to have self-control and not pass on private information. She mentioned a lady who, the president of the Philippines, the woman had a thousand pairs of shoes. Talk about self-control with money. Well, in closing, this is the thing. If you're going to be self-controlled, you have got to determine to be violent, to be self-controlled. I, I mean, I'm serious. You've got to determine. This is worth it. It is worth it to say, I will not check that text message right now. I will say no. And if I can't say no, why not? And someone says, yeah, violent, Matthew 11, the violent... of." take the kingdom of heaven by force. And violence, the, the first verse, second verse should come to your mind is Matthew 5.30. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. Not talking about a literal hand. He's talking about something as close to you as your hand itself. And I'm not here to pick on cell phones, but these cell phones are like part of our body. You get it fused on your arm right here. I mean, it's like a right arm. And so violence is meaning I'm... You know, I'm, I'm going to be violent to overcome this. Self-control is not self-dependence. I just say that don't, don't think I need to go be self-controlled tomorrow and tonight. That means I need to go be self-dependent. You won't get anywhere relying on yourself. You've got to be praying, Lord, give me strength to say no. Give me strength. Help me, Lord, to be self-controlled. So, I hope that's helpful. Um, you know, these are things we're all battling every day. I mean, I'm telling you, some of you have battled it tonight. You'll battle it tomorrow. You'll battle it till the day you die. Every one of us has got to exercise self-control. And remember, the context of Titus 2 and 3, Paul is not just giving due self-control. He's giving the Gospel. And the only way you will exercise self-control it's because the grace of God is in your life training you to live a self-controlled life. That's your only hope. And so pray, Lord, give me more grace. Give me more help. Give me more strength. No, that's true. With, he's saying, someone said, without self-control, you can't have any of the other fruits of the Holy Spirit. If you have no self-control, you can't be patient. You can't be kind. You're going to fail at all of it. Because at the root, you're being selfish, not selfless which is how Christ was. Well, let's pray. Well, Lord, You urge us to be self-controlled. and Lord, help us. I pray You'd help us. Lord, I know in my own life this is, this is such a real thing, just self-control with the computer. And Lord, the sad thing is we hear it all the time. How many times have we heard even Brother Tim Talk about self-control. Self-control. And Lord, we, we know it. We know that. We're not oblivious to it. Lord, just help us, help my brothers and sisters here not to minimize things. Uh, help us not to excuse things. Uh, help us, Lord, not to go out in our own strength to try to exercise self-control. Uh, but Lord, You've promised that Your grace is training us. And so Lord, I pray that power, that regenerating work that You've done, that You would just keep sanctifying every one of us. Lord, that we would be those older men and older women who are not just being self-controlled, but are teaching the younger men and women to be self-controlled. So Lord, I just pray You bless these brothers and sisters here tonight. 
with more holiness in this area. In Jesus' name, amen.